Welcome to another Clear Mountain interview. We're here with uh, Ajahn Jodi Palo, one of our older brother, friend, mentor, teacher, monks. Um, I've known Ajahn Jodi Palo since probably maybe the first day or fairly soon after I came to a Baigiri monastery. Um, so yeah, we're right now in uh, British Columbia visiting Birkin Buddhist Monastery and Ajahn Jodi Palo has uh, agreed that we can interview him. So. As we usually do, I'll read a quick biography. Ajahn Jodi Palo was born in 1965 in Indiana. He received a BA from Wabash College and worked for six years in technical sales. Prior to ordination, Ajahn Jodi Palo became interested in Theravada Buddhism after sitting several Goenka retreats and lived for one year at a Hindu ashram called the Kripala Center in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and one year at the Insight Meditation Center uh, Society excuse me, in Barrie, Massachusetts. While on staff at the Insight Meditation Society, he met Ajahn Amaro and Ajahn Punadamo. After leaving IMS, he spent three months with Ajahn Punadamo at the Arrow River Forest Hermitage in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. And after this, Ajahn Jodi Palo came to live at Abayagiri in 1998 and subsequently spent two years training as an Anagarika and Samanera. He finally ordained as a bhikkhu with Ajahn Pasano as preceptor and on Ajahn Chah's birthday, June 17th, in the year 2000. Since that time, Ajahn Jodi Palo has stayed at Ajahn Chah Branch Monasteries in Thailand, Canada, and New Zealand. In 2018, Ajahn Jodi Palo spent one semester as a visiting fellow studying... A full, full year. A full year, okay. Fint spent a, a full year uh, as visiting fellow studying iconography at St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota. For the last three years, Ajahn Jodi Palo has been living with Ajahn Sona at Birkin Monastery in British Columbia, where we are now. Tanajan, thank you so much for agreeing to... My pleasure. So it wasn't a full year, it was a full academic year. So it was like eight months. Okay. Well, that might be a nice place to, to start. That's um, something which most Theravada monks, certainly American Theravada monks, don't have much experience with. That is this... Uh, overlap of the, the generative aspect or even the artistic aspect and the artistic outlet of being a monk. And I'd be curious to hear more about uh, either how that impulse has manifested in you. I know um, on your uh, webpage, the Icon Yukon uh, webpage, you talk a little bit about uh, starting up art again after taking a bit of a break when you first ordained. Um, but yeah, maybe you could tell us, give us a bit of that history. Right. One of my cohorts in the very first icon retreat that I did was Ajahn Kovilo. Mm -hmm. He uh, he sat. I think he went just to chaperone me. But uh, or did you go because you were interested? I did go. I painted uh, <laughs> at uh, Saint Gabriel. Saint, uh, yeah. One of us did Gabriel. One of us did Michael. I forget. I think you did Michael and I did Gabriel. Actually, I was an art major in college, um, and uh, it was a liberal arts education, so it was more like you know, you know, art history or how to talk about, how to communicate, and, and using art as a, as, as a medium. I never intended it to be like a profession. I never wanted to be a professional artist, to, you know, depend on that to, for survival. Basically, though, after college, I, I really didn't do much painting. I did do a series of ten paintings about whitewater kayaking that I thought came out, you know, really, really well. But then when I discovered monasticism and, and just meditation in general, that, that kind of interest died. And it wasn't until I was actually in the monastery, I think I'd, I'm guessing it was around my fourth or fifth vasa, and I actually decided to pick up icon, or just doing painting as a way of... Uh, to keep engaged, but what I did is I decided, like when I was an art major, I never got into r really good uh, drawing. I was never really good at drawing, and I never got into like say portrait painting. So I had this idea of to, t to actually study what it's like to learn something. Mm. So I studied. I just decided I'm going to just keep practicing um, doing uh, portrait drawings and paintings of Ajahn Chah. I just took one image of Ajahn Chah, kind of the famous one, that you know, he's kind of young Ajahn Chah. And I just kept painting it over and over and over again until I got to where I could do it 95% of the time accurately. Yeah, and here's the, we can show a, later up a, a script. But here's like, I was using this really kind of cheap fabric paint and 
Mm -hmm. But I just kept doing it over and over again until I felt like yeah, I was proficient at it. And then I lost interest, you know, and it was, and it was, what I talk about to people, it's like, it wasn't, it was actually sort of putting forth right effort, learning how I learn a new skill and just paying attention to the effort it took to do it. So a lot of it was like, uh, you just started seeing the moods of, of the mind. Like some days I'd just really be interested and I'd, I'd paint for, or draw or paint for five or six hours. Mm -hmm. And other days I'd sit down and I wouldn't want to do it at all. But because I made a determination, no, every day you do this, even if it was only for like a half hour, I would sit down and do it. And then there'd be certain days where like all I would do would be to clean my paintbrushes. And I remember one of my uh, professors in college um, told me, he said, uh, never leave the studio feeling bad. He said, always, mm -hmm. always try to, and this is a good way to, like for meditation too, like never leave a meditation when you're feeling bad. Mm. Um, and so even if the meditation was bad, you know, brought up bad memory or something, you can dedicate the merit at the end of that to, to your loved ones, to your friends, or someone you know is, is in need. You can just, and just having that aspiration, like, okay, if any goodness came from this today, I dedicate this to my best friend. And then you can feel good about that. The rest of the meditation may have been a disaster, but you can feel good about that last bit. The way I tell the story is, is that we were on a winter retreat and it was, you know, how Ajahn Pasano and Ajahn Amro would have it where we do like two week where we have like, you know, full practice and then half mm -hmm. practice and then, then just unstructured. And we were in the middle of an unstructured period. And for some reason, it was like the best week, or the best day of weather. And it was like, you know, mid 60s. And I did walking meditation all day long. I used to love walking meditation. So I was just doing walking meditation. And just as it started getting uh, in the evening, I went and sat down in my cabin for a cup of tea, and I, I, was, I was ready to fall asleep. I was just, you know, falling asleep, and I was like, oh, I, you know, I was like, pardon me saying, go lay down, but I was just like, I don't want to fall asleep at like six in the afternoon, because I'll be up at midnight, and then it just throw my whole schedule off. So I was like, I got to do something. So I was like, well, if I read a book, I'm going to fall asleep. If I, I can't go out and do walking meditation, I'm, I'm already too tired from that. And all of a sudden I remembered, oh, I have four drawings of Ajahn Chah that I started many years before. Ajahn Yaniko and I were reading about Native American spirituality at that point. And I had these, uh, I had this, this vision just popped in my head. I'm going to do four paintings of the Native American, the Lakota colors, red, black, uh, white, and yellow. I'm going to do four Buddha images um, in those colors. And so I just, I could see it clear in my mind how to do it. So I changed the drawings a little bit. And I started drawing, this was six in the afternoon. I started painting. And I looked down, and all four paintings were completely finished. I had hadn't got up to drink the water. I hadn't done anything. I just sat. I had just painted. I looked over. It was three in the morning. So like nine hours had gone, just like that. I was wide awake, um, you know, not tired at all. And so I went and sat in meditation until dawn. And then I went down. And I told Ajahn Pasano about this. I said that just explained what happened. He goes, "That's not insignificant. Pay attention to that." Mm. And so. I decided to pick it up again to start painting. And it was very shortly after that Ajahn Punadama was visiting a Baigiri, and he's Ukrainian by his ancestry. So we'd, we took him over to visit uh, Father Damien. And at that point, I had been studying a lot about you know artwork at that point, I guess. And there was a teacher at Spirit Rock, Wes Nisker, he used to do a radio program. He always ended his radio program. I never heard it, but I heard this joke. But he said, if you don't like the news, go out and make your own. <laughs> and so I kind of felt like when I was looking at all the various artwork, uh, Buddhist artwork, none of it spoke to me. Like Tibetan artwork, I appreciated it, but it didn't speak to me. Japanese, I didn't appreciate, didn't understand it, so it didn't speak to me. And you know, the stuff I saw in the West that was happening just didn't speak to me either, even though it was Western mm -hmm. artists and stuff, it just didn't speak to me. So I was like, oh, I need to start creating my own. So I was doing a lot of research and studying uh, about art. And then we went over to um, show Ajahn Punadamo the, the monastery there, and Father Damien, the abbot, gave, me a, gave all of us a tour. And I must have asked one too many very specific questions, you know, like, because I remember what it was, was there was a, one of the angels had this sort of something in their, their halo or something. Like this a, is on his icons. Yeah, on his, his icons, yeah. And he had painted, and they had some sort of like blue band on it or something. And I was like, what's that all about? And he just looked at me, and, and he said it was a, a royal insignia that from in Rome that would have signified someone was a postal carrier. 
So these were angels who were intermediary angels that uh, you know would, would speak. So it was, it was his way of sort of portraying that, which I guess is can be common in iconography. But then, you know, after I asked that question and two or three of very pointed like, hey, are you an artist? And I was like, well, I'm you know I'm studying art. He goes, well, I'm doing an icon painting next week. Do you want to come? Yeah. And Ajahn Pasano was like, yeah, go for it, go for it. That was about five years ago, though. I kind of realized the the iconography painting, like the only time I really had to do it, because it, it, when I do it, I, was, I think I was describing to you guys the other day, when I would come back to my cabin after our evening puja, if I picked up my paintbrush, it was like flipping on a switch. Mm -hmm. And I knew I would be awake for another three to five hours. And so it's like, well, do I want to be up until one or two in the morning? And actually, so when I started this whole process, I made some really strong determinations with myself is that I knew I would get, you know, absorbed into the into the pro process and timelessness just overtakes you. And and uh, but I made this determination like I will not miss any communal activities. Hmm. So like if you know I won't you know miss morning pujas, I won't miss meetings, and that was really strong strong determination about that. So that means if you're up till one o'clock at night, but you got to get up at five for morning puja, five thirty. It's like uh, what's going to give sleep or in health or <laughs> are you going to paint and so i gave up my health to do this and uh, so i you know it's like um, um so that was the, the trade-off and so i bet after doing that for a year or two i kind of realized no i need to make some some changes and was look, investigating some options and then this thing with collegeville you know came came available and so i um, and partly i mean the the proposal that I made to Collegeville, and it, and it uh, uh, was what I was there studying, was, you know, how can I take this tradition that Father Damien taught us how to do, you know, how can I take that and then incorporate it into Buddhist language? How can a Buddhist take this Christian language of iconography and, and tell Buddhist stories? And so what I discovered when I was, like, really getting into it was is that the reason Tibetan artwork and the reason Zen artwork didn't speak to me is I didn't speak the language. Hmm. It's a la you know Zen. If you you sent me that really nice book about you know uh, uh, Tibetan iconography and it's you know it's hundreds and hundreds of pages. Just like you know if if, uh, if a Tibetan painting if 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 the if the person's holding their hand this it means this particular teaching. If they're doing this it means another teaching. And and I met this. Uh, um, in Sebastopol, there was a, a monk there who was uh, painting this two-story tall Tonka painting. And I asked him, I said, what do you see when you look at this? I just saw, just, I was overwhelmed with just the joy of looking at this huge Tonka. He said, fear. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean fear? And he said, well, two reasons. He said, one is it's public. He was, you know, kind of doing it for educational purposes. He says, you know, a crazy person could come in here and just throw coffee on it or ruin it, you know. So he saw how attached he was to it. But the other one is, they, he really believes that it's like it's it is a teaching instrument, and like if he's supposed to paint the icon like this and he paints it like that, it could actually interfere with someone's enlightenment. Saint John's is more, it's it's not um, part of say the Eastern Orthodox Church, so it's like icons don't mean anything to them really, and they had a couple of icons out one day for a feast day out in their hallway where the monks enter. Because I would pray with the monks, I'd go in every day with them and sit in the choir with them. And what happened was is that uh, they had one of these icons out front, and I, was, I came over and I was looking at it, and one of the monks there, because like, they don't speak that language either, because you, you grow up studying the iconography and the language that it tells, and he, was, he said, what are, you, what are you looking at? I said, I'm, said, I'm just totally amazed that you have an Aiden Hart icon. He goes, you know who painted it? But I had this idea, I wrote to him, and I said, uh, um, is it appropriate for a Buddhist monk to be using Christian iconography language to, you know, tell a Buddhist story. And he wrote back, he says, well, actually the, the process itself is neutral. It's just a language. He says, you just have to determine if the stories you are telling are, if, if painting, you know, doing it through a painting is the best way to convey the language. So I was really impressed, you know, with that open-mindedness. He was like, it's, the language itself is neutral. It's how, it's the story you want to tell. Hajun, thank you. Um, yeah. You know, bringing up the um, image of uh, the angel with the was it which angel was it with the blue? Um, I think 
was Gabriel. Gabriel? Yeah. Who had the blue kind of messenger's uh, yeah. crown. And um, what I find interesting about that is so often the creative muse is kind of portrayed as this, uh, a messenger from heaven basically mm -hmm. come to give you something. And um, for those who have really engaged and felt inspired by art, I think there is that sense of something's been given you and it brightens the heart. Um, Ajahn Kovilo was uh, part in involved in compiling a book called Paths to Pomoja or, or Joy, uh, which, you know, are these paths towards brightening the mind so that it can settle into meditation. And I'm curious, Ajahn, what you would say about, you know, in the Theravada we don't, you know, we have a lot of language for analytically moving through the states of the mind, but that language that is semi-poetic that seems to touch on some sort of, you know, whatever art taps into and that brightening influence for those who are inclined to, towards it. And I think that can be really important for some people. So I'm curious, how do you see, what advice would you have towards practitioners who find maybe their practice is a bit dry or their you know, in terms of brightening and how would they incorporate this insight into their own lives as practitioners? Right. After I did that first uh, icon workshop with Father Damien, I started, I gave a series of three talks there. I think they're still on Abhagiri's website called The Artist Way, one, two, and three. And as is, as is often the case, like, you know, especially when you're a junior monk at Abhagiri, if you're giving a talk, you might get one or two people commenting about the talk or you know a lay person comes up to you maybe once and asks what did you mean by that you know clarification uh, after I gave those talks I had probably like 30 people come up to me and say I've never heard a monk talk about that before you know it's like that's how I see the world hmm. you know and I've never heard anybody talk about it so I can't remember what the three categories I was trying to tell this to someone the other day and I, I, have, I need to put my head back into it and think about it but I said there were three personality types so one would be like someone who's like totally intellectual um, you know who's, who's maybe like book smarts there's people who are creative like musicians or artists and then there was a third and I forget what type I would consider that to be mm. but uh, and so I feel like what I used to say is at the time it was like um, all of the talks we give it a Giri or if you read Dhamma books or you just basically Dhamma talks anywhere online it seems like it's coming from the intellectual aspect of it. People do tell their own personal stories and, you know, we can use anecdotes and, and uh, you know, we relate to it in different ways other than just, say, reciting the suttas, but it seems to be more analytical, whereas, um, you know, with the artwork, it was, you know, it was obviously approaching it from a way that, and I was talking about, too, like, you know, how it affects my mind and how it affects my meditation, and that's what I think people were more, um, it, to me, it's like, the, the, the finished product, I could, uh, I, I think Ajahn Kovi does, has the largest Jyoti Palo collection of paintings and they were all ones he pulled out of the garbage. <laughs> and, <laughs> and take more. It's, the, it's that process of making what happens in the mind, the energy I get, the, the, the repetitiveness of it, the discipline of it. Mm. And uh, so that's, that's what kind of excites me. But um, what I realized though is like, when we teach lay people, we're almost always coming from the intellectual side, but yet the training we received as Buddhist monks is almost entirely from the creative side. Hmm. Like, when you're in Thailand, you learn how to make your broom that you, you clean your cabin with. There's a huge emphasis on how clean your cabin is. Like, every day you polish the floor with a co coconut husk. Hmm. You know, we sew our own robes. It's just, every aspect of the monastic training is around creativity. Hmm. Every aspect hmm. of it. And I was just like, so that's weird. Like we don't even appreciate the creativity aspect of our own training, mm. and but we do it almost continually. But when we teach, we don't teach that at all. Mm. Uh, John, I'm curious, uh, like hearing about how much energy, yeah. like and how much joy mm -hmm. it brings up for you. Of course, you had joy, pity, and energy. Right. Virya, these are some of the uh, seven factors of awakening. Right. Um, I'm curious if, if you found that your icon painting, either the process or even the larger effect that, that the painting has on your life as a whole throughout, if you're painting for however many hours a day or making videos for however many hours a day, the, uh, even the radiant effect from that might have on your development of some of these other path factors. So it brings up energy, but how does it affect your 
your mindfulness, your sati, or your samadhi. Right. I don't know if I know how to answer that. <laughs> yeah. How would you see it? I mean, you guys have watched me. You've seen how, how it's going. What would, how would you? What would you think? I think some of the. Um, I don't see them as mutually exclusive. I mean, I think when that pity comes up, the energy, and you rest in kind of that brightness, um, or weary comes up, the energy, and it leads to the sense of rapture and really getting involved in something and feeling brightened by it. Um, when you put down the brush, there's this afterglow of, of tranquility, Pasadi. I mean, right. for me, yeah, I, I see like whatever kind of high frequency energy that needs to be expressed after it's expressed, there's, I would imagine, you know, at least I think I see that in you, Ajahn, and certainly in myself, is that there is a settling that's also bright at the same time. I don't know. Right, what you're a creative you're... writer. I'm sure you're. Mm -hmm. you're, you're audience knows that too mm -hmm. and you're creative with your language studies as well yeah. as other other aspects too i guess the, fr the first thing was is when i actually did start the very first time i started doing the the the, the, the drawing just to learn that skill um i used to say i was one of the in the line of meditators that by giving the early days i was one of the headless meditators in the morning <laughs> you look up there would be this shoulders and no head obviously <laughs> But as soon as I started doing the icon painting, especially when I got into it um, after I had that experience of you know, going into that really deep state of concentration mm -hmm. for nine hours, when I started doing it after that, it, that's when I really noticed, is like, if I pick this up, I'm turning a light switch on. Mm -hmm. And even though I was only getting four hours of sleep at night, um, I was wide awake in the morning. Mm -hmm. I was just, yeah, yeah the, the energy was, was, was quite good. I don't know, I mean, it didn't factor over into like all the factors. Like I probably, st you know, because I was tired and, and uh, um, or just, you know, physically getting worn down. I think probably like my, my attitude or, you know, my mental state was probably a little more agitated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, but I'd made these really strong determinations, like I'm not going to miss this. And so, you know, trying to keep those, you know, it was, uh, it was good. And so I don't think like the painting itself, like fa helped every single factor of, yeah. you know, being a monastic or you know, being a meditator, but it was also at the same time, it was like, but it was forcing me to put effort into making determinations yeah. to, you know, trying to be as kind, even though you don't feel, <laughs> mm -hmm. you feel really tired and frustrated. And, and Arjun, in terms of like the, the specifics of, uh, because often when you get really specific, you get to see, like that's where a lot of the insight comes. And I have two questions. One is when you paint the image of a, of a saint, an icon, uh, the Buddha, what are the qualities you try to bring there and how do you do that? Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the other is, and decide which one of these you're more interested in answering, but uh, you know, icon painting and creativity is one tool the Christian monastic orders have really brought to bear to keep their people in robes. Um, I'm curious, you know, you lived around such a community for a while. What other kind of aspects of the Christian training can we as Theravada practitioners bring into our practice that might help us? When a Christian iconographer is doing an icon, um, they use it as prayer. So it's a, especially if it's a, you know, if it's a monastic nun or a monk who's, who's doing it or someone who's just a you know, serious practitioner. So they would use it as prayer. Oftentimes they're being commissioned, so it's like someone's you know, asking them to do it for a particular reason. And what they might do is they might do uh, a lot of research first. So they actually read up about the saint. And if there's like a particular quality that that saint is known for or teachings that they uh, offered, you might read up on those. And if you feel inspired or you know, uh, able to, you might actually take on their practices, their meditation practices. And they say that it's like if, if the iconographer actually has a bit of that ability uh, in them, it actually shines through in the icon. So a Christian iconographer, though, would also spend time in prayer, uh, fasting, and they actually would use then the painting process itself as a, a meditation. Thank you. On this aspect of uh, solitude, but also another one of your artistic avenues is video making. Hello, I'm Ajahn Jyoti Palo. Welcome to Sauntering into Silence. Isn't this gorgeous? 
one thing I've heard some of the senior monks in uh, the Ajahn Chah tradition say, even uh, Ajahn Jayasaro, he's talked about the usefulness of uh, the video format, especially during COVID. Mm -hmm. But even, you know, he lives a, a very secluded lifestyle, um, almost reclusive, you know. Yeah. But he's able to, through different platforms, through people coming and interviewing him, he's able to reach the whole world. Right. And he doesn't have to leave his hut, you know. And so he's even getting more seclusion in a way. Um, so that's just one aspect or one, um, yeah, I, I think there are like some conservative perspectives that kind of throughout all time, you know, kind of look askance at new medium and videography is, is a new medium. You know, right. there, it just hasn't been possible, uh, really certainly not on a, a large scale really until fairly recently. So I'm curious if uh, you could reflect a little bit about um, how videography is a part of your your practice mm -hmm. and also how you see its effect into the world if you are able to see that at all. Right. Yeah. yeah, so in many ways I feel really blessed to be here at Birkin because Ajahn Son has been 110% supportive of what I'm doing. When I first came here I had just had an iPad is the only thing I had and I was just going around and just taking videos with my iPad just to show my family where I was and um, I, that the short video I showed to you of the, the vultures sort of circling in and out through the cloud. As soon as I took that, I just sort of had this realization that it's like, oh, I have all these other videos that I took that summer, and I, I know exactly how I want to make that into like a five-minute little video. And it just, I could see it clearly in my head. So uh, there was a woman here named Dinka who was doing most of the video work for Ajahn Son at that point. And uh, she worked with a, a very complex Da Vinci uh, was the, the editing software. And so she sat down one time and sort of showed me how she did it. And then I, I kind of gave her like almost second by second instructions of how I saw this video flowing. And then came back like two days later and she had it finished. And we made a, you know, some back and forth on it. But there was something about me that's like when I was growing up in high school and college, I always kind of had in the back of my mind I wanted to make movies. But it was expensive. You had to have cameras, and it just you know was out of the means for you know, somebody like me. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't until I had this this iPad and I made that video. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I can do this with just a little tiny. You can do it with a little camera the size of this. When I was in high school and college, I would go if I saw a movie that intrigued me that I liked, I would go back and watch it four or five, six times in a row. In the theater. In the theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would <laughs> each night go back and just mentally it was like I would be paying attention to the dialogue. Or I'd be going back and paying attention to how the music affected the mood of it, and and or um, it is various different aspects to it. And I would do that with, with any good movie that I saw. So I've been training myself since high school to be a videographer, and didn't really know it until last year. Um, Ajahn Sona asked if I would make a movie about our work scene we did last year. So I made him this, this 50, 50 minute long movie, and as soon as I hit the send button, I broke into tears. And it was just, it was really emotional moment for me because I realized, wow, that was a lifetime vision, goal, dream that I had that I actually had never put into words. And it's like when it happened, it was just like, wow, I just accomplished something that I've been working my whole life to do. And uh, so at a certain level, it's like there's been so many videos that I've made, like, uh, I, I do like making him to music, and so I know that's controversial in, in the Thai Forest tradition, but like Ajahn Sona, what he points out is like, we don't live in 5th century BC. You know, we don't ride around elephants. You know, we, we use modern technology. We have, there is a, a society that we live in and it has a culture. So like we need to, instead of you know, trying to indoctrinate Buddhism into the Western culture, we need to take Western culture and make it our own in the Buddhist sense. And, and that's a way for other people to get into but I, I like using music because it gives me a template to actually how to... How, I, I can cut a frame any way I want to. Like there's a bird flying, but where do you cut it? You know? But if there's a, there's a chord change in a song or a new instrument enters into it, like there's all these places you can use it as a scaffolding for your create, creation. So that's why I like using, the, you know, using music. Like, I don't have a very good memory for chanting, for even Dhamma talks. Like, if you, I'm glad you haven't asked me, what's your favorite sutta? Or, you know, what do you think about this sutta? Because I hear it and I can appreciate it. I, under, you know, I can understand when I'm, when I'm listening to it. But literally, like, five minutes later, I won't remember who even the sutta was about. Mm -hmm. 
it's just something in my mind. Just I'm not that. I don't have that kind of mind. So it's interesting. We're talking about you know, there's these different personality types, and and I'm just not, as far as I know, anyway, just not. That's not my calling is to be someone to give sermons that way. But I think I can do it through visual means. One thing I find interesting is how rich what you were when we asked about sort of the practical means of how what you try to bring to a a painting there was such uh such depth in what came out of that out of nowhere i didn't expect you know i mean this sort of history of like how the christians use it as prayer and all this and i find that very interesting when um you know that distinction between um working with the world and with craft and the sort of spiritual realm uh, that distinction becomes blurred or non-existent you know like I ask about how you work with a painting and suddenly there's this you know amazing discussion of prayer I'm curious if if there's any other really interesting um, principles that you've learned um, tied to tradition or not around you know selection of color or materials for an icon um you know, I know there's that, uh, I think it's called the tri, trifold, um, triptych. triptych, the triptych, um, and how you see that done in a Buddhist context, um, yeah, like, all, all those basics of the craft, uh, and I know preparing the triptych is an important aspect of the whole process as well. Right, so, yeah. Well, from the Christian perspective, um, Ajahn Kovilo could have answered this question, the icon board is like, Every aspect of it is from nature. So it's like, you know, he doesn't use like acrylic paints, even though, you know, everything comes from nature at some level, I guess. But it's like, it's a wooden board that's been processed. It's got this, you know, the gesso's made out of, um, unfortunately, it's like rabbit skin glue is what they use, but it's like chalk or marble dust. You know, it's like elements from the earth to make the board. The medium that you paint with is actually the egg yellow. So it's, you know, this organic uh, element. And the, the colors all come from, usually they're minerals. So it's, it's ground up, uh, it's either clays or uh, minerals that are, you know, ground up into these, these fine colors. And so like everything is from, and a Christian tradition would look at it as like, these are gifts from God, mm. you know, but it's, it's like from the earth and, and, and it all, you know, fits together to create this, this image of the divine. So you're using worldly elements to create an image of the divine, which is a window into the divine. Use of color. It's interesting, it's like uh, um, Ajahn Sumedho's sister, who just recently passed away, Virginia, I showed her an icon I had of, uh, of uh, St. Francis, one of the first ones. It was actually, a, I think it was a triptych that I, I had, and all right, that I made. And I painted him in black robes, and uh, she was like, "No, no, you, you know, you, you, Saint Francis is always wearing brown robes." I said that to Father Damien, the, the icon painter, and he just sort of rolled his eyes. He goes, "You can paint in whatever color you want." <laughs> For every rule, there's uh, there are, there are certain rules. It's like there are certain saints that you would paint them a particular way, because when they're painted that way, you just know that's who it is, and so it, it's a language. But even like language, you can. You can cut off the last few consonants of the word just to make it sound something different, you know, like um, like rappers do. You know, it's still language, but it's just not exactly what it was. So there's there's give and take with it. So yeah, color has significance. The the shapes, the forms do have significance. And so it's interesting to me. It's like when because so a lot of what I did there was really just sort of you know, going deeper into the Christian iconography and figuring out the language that they were, they were painting or, you know, how they were conveying things. But then, like, I felt, I actually have hesitancy to go deeper into the, the Buddhist aspect of it because in a Christian iconography, it's like they already have the canon set. So, like, these are the stories you can tell. These are the colors Schemes that you can use. This is how you paint Saint Anthony. He always has a beard, and you know he's he's painted this way, and and so. But it's like, what does Sariputta look like? <laughs> you know, it's like I can go and look at what Saint Anthony looks like, and they're all you know it's pretty much the same. But it's like I felt subconscious trying to say this is what the Buddha looks like in my vision, or this is what what uh, Mogalana Mahamogalana would look like, and I really felt kind of hesitant to do that. 
this is my favorite story about icons, and I can I can go on for hours about icons. But anyway, so I was reading this this book of the icon, and uh, and I was looking at it's a it's a picture of again Gabriel coming down to tell Mary that she's she's bearing the, the Christ child, and they're talking about icons are painted in various different perspectives. Do you remember that? Um, vaguely. Yeah. So it's like um, what they do, and well, this is one of the, my funniest stories or best stories with with Father Damien. When I went back to do a second icon, I showed him this icon of uh, that I wanted to do. It was very similar to the one you had you had there with the the halo behind it. And he goes, "Oh, is that a is that a mandorla?" And I was like, "What's mandorla means?" He goes, "Well, it's an almond." And I was like, "Well, what is what is almond? You know, like what?" And what is that spiritual? And he goes, well, it is an eye into the universe. I said, well, that's fascinating because in the Tibetan tradition, it's mandala. Mm. And I said, a mandala is, you know, you see them, they're, you know, it's a, usually squared off four different colors and very symmetrical. But actually, a mandala is a three-dimensional model of the universe. So he was saying that the mandala is a window into the universe, but the mandala is a three-dimensional model of the universe. Mm. But Ajahn Amro is explaining that not only is a mandala three-dimensional, but it's also spinning. Mm -hmm. And so not only is it spin, not only spinning, but you, to see it symmetrically, have to be centered. Mm -hmm. If you're not centered over the mandala, if you're over here and it's spinning, everything is chaos. Mm -hmm. So like in a Christian icon, usually the, the saint will be holding a book. And so the, the front page of the, in, in a normal perspective, the closest page to you is going to be bigger and it's smaller in the background. So like, you know, um, like those trees back there are the same size as these trees here, but they look smaller way off in the distance. So the vanishing point in a normal painting or in a landscape, normal landscape, the vanishing point is behind us. That's the vanishing point. So they do a reverse perspective in icons. So when the saint is holding the book, the back page is bigger than the front page. So the vanishing point in an icon is you. That's fascinating. Ajahn, I also remember um, that point and then also uh, about coloration or about shadowing. Yeah. So it's like, yep. you know, in a lot of Western uh, painting, yep. you know, shadows are just like they are in the world. Like yeah, the so like right now the shadow's here on my nose because the sun is coming from here. Whereas in iconography, the light is coming from here. Yeah. And I've thought about that in terms of the second Dhammapada verse. Mm. Like, you know, everything comes from the mind. All Dhamma is perceived from the mind. Right. And, you know, when you speak or act or think from a mind that's pure, it's like happiness that follows you forever, like a shadow that never leaves. And I thought about that as being like these icons that have, you know, the shadow is being exposed outwards. So it's like the light is coming from within. So it's like the shadow mm -hmm. is just, it's just your aura, basically. Right. I never thought about this till you just said that. But if you are looking at an icon and, you know, praying to an icon, if the light is coming from the icon, there's no shadow on you either. Mm. Your yes. shadow, your shadow is behind you. You've or, you've transcended your own shadow, your own dark side. <laughs> so you, you, you've overcome the shadow. So it was really fascinating. With this. this is great. This is all ties into this. So I was reading Egon Sendler, and he's talking about the it's the ascension. I think is the icon. Let's call where Mary's being given this this news that she's carrying the Christ child. Egon Sendler points out that. The angel, Gabriel, is painted in a particular type of perspective, isometric perspective, and um, Mary is painted in reverse perspective, in the same, same icon, but she's on this throne. She's, and as soon as I read it, just reading that, even, even before I actually even probably read it, I, just, I knew where he was going with this, I looked at the icon and Mary jumped out of the icon. She was literally like two feet in front of the painting. And uh, you didn't have 3D glasses. Anymore. I did not, and I couldn't get her back into the painting. And it was she's, she just she, she just came out. And what what it said to me was like you know a Christian icon. If you know how to read the language, if you understand the language and know how to read them, it was like you come to an icon in prayer. It's like Mary's going to come out and say, "Are you ready for this?" Mm -hmm. Like you know, if you do loving kindness meditation, it's like, I, I used to, I gave a talk once and it, the person told me it was, the, it was the best attended talk they ever gave. And it was, uh, uh, I, it was titled, Why I Hate Doing Loving Kindness Meditation. <laughs> and uh, part of it is, is, it's like, I feel like if we are really wishing for peace, or we're really wishing for kindness or understanding, 
if we're doing things in our life that are preventing us from doing that, but you have a deep, sincere wish for that to happen, the dark side of you is going to come out. You have to face it. You have to see it. You have to understand it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's why I think a lot of times people get turned off to meditation is that they feel like, you know, oh, I came here to do loving kindness meditation, but all I feel is anger or all I'm feeling is regret and remorse. It's like, well, no, no. It's, it's not that you have to relive every single bad memory, but it's like, you're going to have to understand what your temperament is. And then, as Ajahn Sona is always saying, it's like, no, you don't have to pick it up. You know, you don't have to pick up the pain and the sorrow. It's just, you just have to develop that, the, you know, see that that's not worth picking up. And then you, then you do develop the kindness and the goodness and focus on that. And then it just eradicates the, the negative. You don't have to process everything. It's not a, not, not a psychology that we have to understand every bad thing we ever did. I think that's that that's enough for now. It's perfect. No, it's wonderful. And uh, thank you so but much nine for hours. Nine, nine hours. Nine hours. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Ajahn, for your guidance, um, for bringing kind of this other splash of color to things, and uh, yeah, for that, taking the time with us. A splash of color. <laughs> that's why I like to saunter. <laughs> All right, we didn't even get into sauntering. Okay. Next time.